Hello and welcome to Objective Health. Um, this week's show, I am your host, Elliot, and I'm joined with me in the virtual studio by Erica, Doug and Tiff. Hello. Welcome. And on the Wheels of Steel, we have Damien Hello. behind the scenes. Excellent. And so in today's show, we are going to be looking at some possible possible solutions or some uh yeah possible things that people might be able to do to prepare their body in the unfortunate event that they would be forced to have a vaccine or that they for whatever reason were required to take one of the new vaccines and this is really applicable to many vaccines similar principles that we've kind of come up with can be applied to any kind of vaccine i think and we'll talk about why this is but this is so in this case at least particularly um relating to the um mrna vaccines if we can call them that so what we've tried to do is come up with some solutions um, as to how we can prepare the body or things that we can use, things that we can take, things that we can do to hopefully provide some degree of protection. Now, at this point, as you know, if you're familiar with the show and you've heard what we're speaking about and you're following the situation cl- cl- um, closely, you'll be aware that this new mRNA technology is is pretty novel um no one really knows the effects that this is going to have on the human body long term a lot of it is entirely experimental and the people who are having this vaccine um are basically guinea pigs at this point and so it's really difficult to know exactly what we're dealing with in terms of the severity of the issues that this can cause for people we've spoken about in previous shows the immediate side effects that some people have been having and that involves immune hyperreactivity it means their um anaphylaxis and in some cases you know very swift death in other cases it's within a couple of days someone might have a very strange immunological reaction in some cases there was one case we were talking about um a fellow who developed a a strange autoimmune condition against his own platelets he eventually died there are lots of strange things going on and it seems there's more and more cases coming out by the day. So it's a situation that we need to follow very closely. That being said, um, this co-host of this show has done a lot of research on this. I myself have also tried to put in some research into the underlying mechanisms by which the vaccine can cause damage to the human body. Um, some of the mechanisms by which we might be able to mitigate some of those effects using particular types of medicines, using particular types of nutrients, and also employing some lifestyle or behavioral kind of strategies to try in the best way to mitigate the effects. Uh, but first of all, I'd just like to give a disclaimer that, you know, as I said before, It's very experimental. A lot of this stuff is very theoretical and this is not medical advice whatsoever. Furthermore, we cannot guarantee that if someone does exactly what we're talking about in this show, (laughs) that they will not get a reaction at this point. We, we can only do our best. Yeah. So, um, how do we want to start off this show guys? What, what what do we want to start off with? We should probably tell people about the article that Dr. Gabby wrote. Um, it's on SOT.net, S-O-T-T.net, and it's called COVID Mass Vaccination Experiment. Prepare for the worst with this health protocol. And in it, you'll see the, um, the protocol that Elliot has uh, come up with, uh, the experimental one, and Dr. Gabby adds a few things on there as well. So, well, maybe we should just start by, by going through it. What do you think, Elliot? Yeah. Okay. 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 So, okay. So in doing some research for looking at this, the mechanism by which this vaccine works, just to go over the very basics. And there's, what I will say is that there's not much research on this. Again, it's very novel. It's very experimental. 
Um, it turns out they've been doing research on lipid nanoparticle delivery of uh, mRNA, which is what they're using. Basically, they encapsulate mRNA into what's called a lipid nanoparticle. It's usually primarily composed of polyethylene glycol. Um, and what they're doing is they're injecting that into the body and, and aiming for the lipid nanoparticles to pass into the cell. Once they get into the cell, it releases mRNA. The mRNA is then what it's designed to do is basically be picked up by some of the machinery that the cell uses to make proteins. Um, and the the machinery inside the cell is meant to take that mRNA, use that as a template to produce these things called spike proteins. Okay. So the concept behind the vaccination is that you're providing your body with basically the template from which to build new proteins. You're not giving your body the virus. You're giving the body the template to build new proteins. Okay. And this is mRNA. And so in the research, what they've been looking at is, I mean, there's there's some things immediately that can can that can go wrong with this, and this is something that we've been seeing with the side effects that have been occurring in quite a lot of people in recent times since the the deployment of the vaccine. So first of all, we have the fact, and we've spoken about this previously, we have the fact that polyethylene glycol can be um, it can trigger a hypersensitivity or hyperreactivity of the immune system. If someone has IgE, anti-IgE antibodies against this substance, uh, which is a toxic chemical, then um, what that can do is that can trigger um, the immune system and activate a variety of different processes which lead to anaphylaxis. And some people do die from that. Other people, they might not die from that. Um, this particular chemical is also associated with activation of another kind of branch of the immune system, which is referred to as the complement system. Now, the complement system, uh, long term, it's been associated with autoimmune attack, uh, attack against one's own, one's own tissues, um, destruction of organs and generalized kind of systemic inflammation. And so uh, looking kind of in, or in, in preparing what, what we want to try to do is to provide the body with as much protection against the potential detrimental effects of the immune stimulation done by poly, polyethylene glycol. That's, that's one kind of principle. A second principle, what we're looking at here, and this is something that the researchers have come across, is that when someone... Um, if, if we are looking to protect ourselves from the long-term effects of the vaccine, not just the immune stimulation that might occur immediately after a vaccine, but if we're looking at providing the body with some kind of long-term protection, because as we've spoken about, it's entirely experimental and we don't really know what this mRNA is doing, is having an effect long-term. Do we want ourselves to be making this spike protein, first of all? That is the purpose of the vaccine. And people who want to have the vaccine, they will think that that's a good thing. We don't know that that's a good thing. And we don't know the potential long-term effects of having our body generate copious amounts of this foreign protein. I personally would not want my body to do that. I would not. I would want to ideally if we could in any kind of way, is to prevent ourselves from using that raw material template to make a, a protein. If we can prevent that or, or you know, uh, if we can avoid that process um, any step of the way, I think that that might also be a good thing. And so this has been a problem in the research, and I hope that I'm kind of making sense through this, but basically what researchers have found is that there are some inherent issues with using this kind of formulation, trying to trick the body to, to use it as it, to generate proteins. There's lots of things that can go wrong in that process. Um, and one of the things that can occur is that our cells, rather than using this mRNA to, trans, uh, to translate that into proteins, our cells can actually degrade that. And that is what does happen in some of the experiments. And so many of the researchers looking at these, nano, na, um, these, these nanoparticles have been trying to find ways to stop cells from degrading the mRNA rather to use it for generating protein sequences, if that makes any sense. And so the kind of principles in de devising this protocol, the, the main things that I wanted to focus on here was to provide the immune system with as much possible protection against 
the immune stimulation, the immune hyperreactivity and the toxicity of something like polyethylene glycol to provide as much kind of raw material to boost antioxidant defenses, to boost our detoxification capacity and to boost our cells protection against chronic inflammation, against um, oxidative stress, against a lot of these kind of things that can occur with hypersensitivity reactions. And secondly, the other element to this was to if in any way possible, potentially prevent the mRNA from being used inside the cell in the first place, right? Because if we can prevent the mRNA from being translated into proteins, then it means that we might be able to, you know, kind of reduce the amount that we are making, reduce the the amount of spike protein that we're making. I I don't know. It, It seems possible looking at the research. Who knows? Right. Basically, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit lost here. I don't, I don't want to lose the audience. Why don't we go into the um, the first part of that? Because you basically laid out two different kind of um, purposes behind um, this protocol. So why don't we first go into the the first part that you talked about, like the uh, stopping the um, overactivation of the immune system, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so if we look at what polyethylene glycol or any other kind of toxic substance can do ultimately is, um, when it is triggering the innate immune, the, the innate immune system or the adaptive immune system, um, this can trigger like a chronic inflammatory systemic response. Um, and this is often what kills people. It's their immune system becoming hyperreactive. It's not necessarily the chemical which kills someone. It's the same for any kind of toxic substance. Oftentimes it's immune hyperreactivity. So there's various substances that we can use to try to reduce that immune hyperreactivity and try to boost our innate defenses. And so if we look at some of the things which generally occur in any kind of vaccine related injury, there is, um, there is a, uh, a massive burden placed on the way that our bodies can detoxify okay and and how we can basically protect the cells and so one of the main primary cellular antioxidants um is called glutathione now when there is chronic systemic oxidative stress um glutathione is going to be one of the first things which becomes tanked and what we can try to do and what has been used to prevent side effects from vaccines in the past is providing the raw materials that the body might use to generate massive amounts of glutathione to protect themselves against the oncoming threat. And so if we look at what makes glutathione, the primary precursors are two amino acids. Well, there's three amino acids, but you you would supplement with two amino acids um, to provide the body with enough raw material to make that. One of those is called N-acetylcysteine and the other one is called glycine. Now, N-acetylcysteine, again, this has been used to pr- pr- protect against things like uh, acetaminophen toxicity. Um, and again, it's very protective for the liver. Glycine, again, this is very cheap. It can be bought in powder form. This is particularly useful for the nervous system. But again, by providing those two amino acids, we can um, give our body enough uh, material to to generate glutathione when we need that. Um, Another option for people that they can they can potentially do is um, is to purchase glutathione in its liposomal form. So you can get glutathione, preformed glutathione, which your body can use as an antioxidant. Um, but unfortunately, the bioavailability or the absorption is very poor in the gut. Whereas if we're using a liposomal form, so this is encapsulated within kind of like a fat liposome, um, then what that can do is it can bypass that lack of bioavailability and it increases the absorption significantly. And so the dose for this, I would say, is going to need to be quite high. You would want to be taking probably a gram, at least a gram, maybe two grams per day. Um, And you would want to do that in the days leading up to vaccination. And so a lot of these recommendations, I think that someone, if they know that they're going to be forced to get this vaccine, they want to provide their body with as much support leading up to the date. So let's say that they get told that they're going to have a vaccination in two weeks. I would start it two weeks beforehand or at least a week beforehand to really build up those defenses for the oncoming threat. Okay. Um, Next, there are, several other things which can be used as what are referred to as immune modulators. What this means is, is these are specific substances 
which can either suppress the inflammatory response or modulate it in a way which is potentially going to be beneficial. So we spoke about how polyethylene glycol can stimulate the complement system. Now, two particular complement inhibitors. So what this means is, is they, they inhibit that branch of the immune system, which can be stimulated by the vaccine. If we use these two nutrients um, what we can potentially do is provide like a, a balancing effect to prevent immune hyperreactivity. One of those is referred to as curcumin. This is the bioactive compound uh, found in turmeric, the herb. Um, but curcumin, again, has very low bioavailability. And so there's various companies online who sell uh, curcumin in a liposomal format. And again, this would want to be taken in a fairly high dose, probably double the recommended dose on the bottle. Um, but this is one of the excellent kind of plant medicines or plant compounds, which is it, it's been studied in various kinds of inflammatory disorders. It's very good for things like arthritis. I think it might be potentially helpful in this kind of situation. Another compound is referred to as rosmarinic acid. This is found in very high levels in uh, certain herbs such as sage, um, and rosemary. It's what gives it that kind of characteristic spicy fla flavor, I think. Um, but this, this is fairly, fairly uh, difficult to, to source. But if you can get hold of rosemary and acid or even rosemary extract, I think that this could come in handy. What this has been shown to do, likewise, is it's a very potent complement inhibitor. So again, it's it, it, it in, inhibiting that area of the immune system, which might be stimulated excessively. Um, in that article, um, what Gabby mentions is using vitamin C in quite a high dose or in extremely high dose, basically referred to as mega dosing vitamin C. And she, she uh, cited a protocol which was um, provided by another doctor, I believe, um, uh, basically a case study uh, using um, very high doses of vitamin C um, in one of his patients who was who basically had to get the MMR vaccine. And so they were using um, one gram per, um, I think the maintenance dose was 1000 milligrams or one gram per age. So, 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 so per year of age. Um, but also what they were doing in the days before, it says that um, their 37 pound daughter received saturation level doses of 8,000 to 11,000 milligrams of vitamin C every single day, bef uh, every day, the week before the MMR vaccine. They said um, that the tolerance gradually built up. If you've taken vitamin C in the past, then you'll know that kind of um, it could take a while to get to bowel tolerance in that uh, if you first start taking a thousand milligrams or a couple thousand milligrams, you might reach bowel tolerance very quickly. Um, but generally, as you build up on the dose, you, you, you become more accustomed to that. And furthermore, when the body is under some kind of stressful event, that can also increase bowel tolerance uh, greatly. Uh, what they showed was that um, on the day of her shot, she happily and comfortably held 24,000 milligrams. So that's 25 grams. For the next couple of days after the shot, her dose was reduced to 20,000 milligrams per day. Then for the next four days, it went down to 15,000 milligrams. The next four, 14,000, 13,000, 12,000, and 11,000 milligrams, respectively. So these are massively high doses. Um, but the, the, the kind of concept behind this was providing um, significant amounts to to really provide as much protection as possible against the the kind of toxic threat that is the MMR vaccine. Now, there's lots of potential ways by which vitamin C is working here. Vitamin C is not only an antioxidant, but vitamin C has been shown to have numerous different effects on the immune system, particularly protecting against things like hyperreactivity of the immune system. Again, one of the problems with MMR is this immune hyperreactivity. And so anything that we can do to bring that down um, is going to be potentially helpful, I think. Is there anything that you guys want to add to that? <laughs> no okay right. you're being Excellent. very thorough <laughs> okay okay okay, Way okay. more no. thorough than we could be <laughs> right so so vitamin c can be purchased as ascorbic acid 
Um, and that is the cheapest form, of course. Some people simply do not tolerate that or they find it very, um, they find that they reach bowel tolerance very quickly. And so one of the potential solutions for that situation is to use a liposomal form. Like I was saying with, um, with the glutathione, what we can do is we can increase bioavailability. We can increase how much we can absorb and utilize by using a liposomal form. Again, it is quite a lot more expensive, but in this kind of situation, I think that if you can afford it, I personally would make the investment. That's that's for sure. I would probably use a mixture of the two. Um, but yeah, I mean, any protection that can be provided, I think is going to come in handy. Um, you can make it. You can make liposomal vitamin C at home with a few, you know, blender and a few things. Well, it may be still on the internet, but it might not be on how to do, how to make your own liposomal vitamin C at home. Yeah, indeed. I mean, there are people who who claim that they can do that. Right. And I, I, um, I've never done it myself and I don't know whether it actually works or not. I think it does. I assume that it does. Um, and I think it's with lecithin. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We've made it for years. Yeah. Tastes like eggnog. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah so so i mean by all means if if people want to find a recipe and and um and 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 find a way to do that then that would be that would that would also be a potential situation anything which can get more vitamin c into the system without inducing uh bowel tolerance because once you reach bowel, reach bowel tolerance then um then it's very difficult to kind of uh build upon that uh, intravenous vitamin C might also come in handy in this kind of situation, along with other types of uh, intravenous nutrients, I think. Um, right. Okay. So we were talking, we've spoken about the the potential kind of immune hyperreactivity or immune activation. Um, another factor that can very much help and has been used um, to, to actually treat uh, coronavirus or they've used it as a protocol at least involved with other things um is is going to be vitamin d and so as gabby mentions it in this um article you'd probably want to check what your vitamin d status is vitamin d is fat soluble so what that means is is that you don't want to massively overdo it some people they already supplement and it Turns out that toxicity is probably a lot more common um, than we've been led to believe. But that being said, uh, you'd want to make sure because if you're running low on vitamin D, vitamin D is one of those things. It's not just the, the sunshine vitamin. It's particularly useful for preventing the immune system from going haywire, right? So there's research showing that, for instance, people with low vitamin D status are fundamentally uh, more more susceptible to a wide variety of problems. And that can inv- involve issues when the immune system, you lose control of the immune system and we get what's referred to as this kind of cytokine storm. And this is why one of the reasons um, why coronavirus deaths, if you look at the, the mortality rate, vitamin D is a major risk factor. And those with lower vitamin D are, are significantly more likely to come to something like that. And it applies to any kind of viral infection, anything which is um, going to be involving the immune system. We need to kind of make sure that we've got adequate levels on board. Now, I'm not a massive fan of, of, uh, of mega dosing vitamin D, although some practitioners might recommend that. I personally am a little bit more kind of conservative with how much that I would recommend. I would not be scared to go anywhere from kind of, um, 10,000 per day personally, uh, just in the days leading up to it. But I would make sure, try to have your levels checked in the meantime. Um, speaking about, so so we've spoken about kind of trying to modulate the immune system, giving things for the immune system, giving sufficient antioxidants, vitamin C, glutathione, giving the raw material for generating anti- antioxidants, glycine, N-acetylcysteine, giving immune modulators, Again, vitamin C, vitamin D, uh, glute, um, rosmarinic acid, curcumin, uh, berberine might come in handy. Quercetin could come in handy. All of these things have been shown to kind of modulate the immune system and calm it down when it might be hyperreactive, hyper, hyperreactive. Um, but in looking at how we can also provide ourselves with some degree of protection, what we have to understand is that cells, when they are placed under threat, this increases the requirement for metabolism. What that means is it increases the requirement for energy. Your cells need energy to 
patch up damage. Your cells need energy to deal with any kind of stressor or any kind of threat. And so what we want to make sure is that our cells can generate sufficient amounts of energy to be able to cope with or counterbalance the potential threat that they're going to be coming up against. Again, this applies to any kind of vaccine or any kind of toxic threat. And so the, the primary kind of machinery inside the cell that is generating energy is going to be the mitochondria, okay? Now, the way that we're generating energy, we take food, we break that down into very small molecules, and then we run it through various processes, various steps, and each of those steps requires nutrients, micronutrients, B vitamins, and minerals, okay? And so, by supplementing with micronutrients, what we can do is we can stimulate or we can increase the rate at which cells generate energy, or we can provide enough kind of baseline material so that in the event that we do have a major stressor, we have enough kind of backup um uh, yeah, backup stores to be able to match that kind of metabolic demand, if that makes any sense. And so the next kind of phase of this protocol, which again, I would start anywhere from one to two weeks before doing the vaccine, this would be what is referred to as a mitochondrial cocktail. This is a kind of cocktail that they would, that, that, that doctors, practitioners have used for many years um, to kind of, um, again, to support how cells are making energy, but at the same time um, to protect against kind of many immune threats as well. So this is going to involve vitamin B1, uh, a, a, a B complex, um, vitamin B3, coenzyme Q10, oloperic acid, alpha oloperic acid, adenosyl B12, so vitamin B12 in its adenosyl form, a methylated B complex, a multimineral. Um, essentially, we, we don't necessarily have time to go through the details of what all of these do. Um, it doesn't, I, I'd say the, the form it can be important, but ultimately if someone doesn't have the uh, choice, if the only thing that they can get hold of is standard forms of, of B vitamins, I think that loading up on B vitamins, megadosing B vitamins can be very helpful. Just, I mean, the, the, the details are laid out in this article. So if listeners want to go to that, they can see the details. Um, I mean, do you think that I need to go over doses, guys, or not? I think since all that stuff's in the article itself, we can probably can probably leave that people can read that in the article which we'll of course link in the description okay 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 basically yeah the the main key points to understand is that we want to provide as much micro nutrition as possible so that we can stimulate mitochondrial function and this comes back to energy if we are in an energy deficit that's not something that we necessarily want to be in in terms of protecting ourselves against a major threat um, there are two other nutrients which are very, uh, very handy. One is called zinc. Another one is called selenium. Both of these have actually been uh, employed in protocols which have been designed to uh, protect against COVID itself. But again, generally, these are kind of immune supporting minerals. They are very beneficial for kind of stabilizing proteins, for generating kind of anti antioxidant responses or pro-oxidant responses. And so zinc and selenium, these are two minerals which I think are particularly important um, and should be included in any kind of immune supporting protocol. Um, very quickly, what I do want to say is that in looking for, and this probably applies um, more, more so to the mRNA-based vaccine, but I would say it also applies to any other kind of vaccination. Um, in looking through the, the research into how cells are actually taking this mRNA um, raw material and incorporating that into proteins, we've said that there might be long-term side effects of incorporating this mRNA into foreign proteins. We, we, I, I don't think that this is something that we want to do, okay? I personally, would, I, I, I don't want to do this. or want to avoid this. And so I was looking at how the researchers had, had, had found, how could they protect themselves or how could they stop cells from incorporating this mRNA and, and degrading it? How, you know, what is it about cells which degrade mRNA and get rid of it and don't use it compared to cells that use mRNA to generate proteins? And so it seems that there is a fundamental difference between the cells that use mRNA and the cells that break it down. And that difference relates to energy status of the cell. And what does that mean? Well, it means that if cells are in a position where they have 
lots of energy. In fact, they have excess energy and they are in the state of anabolic or building mode. They're building things up. They're building proteins. They're building fats. In other words, when the rate of energy requirement or the rate of energy um, turnover is hot, is, is, is less than the demand for energy, it means that our cells can build things up. And when they build things up, what that essentially translates to is that we are taking this mRNA uh, kind of protein and we are bringing that into the cell to build new proteins. So in very simple terms, when cells are in building mode, they are going to make use of that mRNA and they are more likely to generate the spike protein. On the other hand, when cells are in breakdown mode, when cells are not building up things, when they're not building fats, when they're not building proteins, on the other hand, when they're breaking those down for energy, when there's a high turnover energy, and there's a high demand for energy, what that means is, is that the mRNA is going to be less likely um, to kind of be translated into proteins. What we're going to do is we're going to take that mRNA, we're more likely to break it down. Okay. If that makes any sense, basically, cells can either build things up or break things down. We want our cells to be in a state where they're breaking things down. Okay. That's what it seems like. And again, it's theoretical, but it seems that that is a potential way that cells are going to be less likely to be affected by this mRNA sequence or this mRNA kind of uh, vaccine delivery. And so how can we in any way, how can we shift the body away from building up mode towards breakdown mode? And so it's really quite simple. What we want to, I think what we might want to do is set the stage or provide the environmental conditions in our body so that we are, so that we perceive that we do not have much resources or that we do not have enough resources to be building things up. We want to be breaking things down. What that translates to in real life is fasting. I think that that could potentially be a very useful, um, useful strategy. In fact, if we look at the biochemistry underpinning this anabolic mode or this breakdown mode in biochemical or medical terms, what this is referred to is as mTOR. You have a, a cell program inside the cell called mTOR, and mTOR is responsible for building things up. On the other hand, the breakdown mode or the kind of, um, yeah, this, this, this kind of regeneration mode where we are breaking things down, this is referred to as the AM, AMPK pathway. Now, mTOR and AMPK are often opposed. So either we are in AMPK, our cells are in AMPK, or they're in mTOR. Now, if we want to protect ourselves from the mRNA vaccine, I think that being in AMPK is going to be a useful strategy, whereas mTOR, they, the, the research shows that mTOR essentially, when a cell is, is basically using this pathway called mTOR, then it's going to be incorporating mRNA into proteins. Um and so if we look at kind of many of the health advice that we've given over the many years doing this show, and if anyone is interested in alternative health or whatnot, they have probably heard about the benefits of doing fasting. They've probably heard of the benefits of calorie restriction. They might have heard of the benefits of cold therapy, for instance. They might have heard of the benefits of ketogenic diets or low-carbohydrate diets. And in many respects, a lot of these benefits um, that – a lot of these kind of strategies, the primary benefits of these strategies are fairly similar to one another. And the reason why they work so well is because they take us out of this mTOR pathway and they, they take us towards, or they activate this AMP pathway, AMPK pathway. And so what this helps us to do is it helps us to clear out unnecessary waste. It helps us to um, clean up or repair tissue. It helps us to get rid of what we don't need and essentially keep what we do need. And so some of the, the very well-known strategies to basically get our body into this breakdown mode is to stimulate mitochondrial energy metabolism. That's one thing. Increasing the turnover of, of substrate, increasing the turnover of energy. And at the same time, um, is to engage in specific practices, one being called um, cold therapy. So this is this can be either taking cold showers, this can be bathing in cold water, this can be um, hyperbaric, no, not hyperbaric oxygen, what's it called? Um, cryogenic. 
Yeah, cry, cryogenic therapy, where we're exposed to extremely cold air. Um, all of these things trigger our cells to go from that building mode to, to going towards that breakdown mode. Um, at the same time, fasting or calorie restriction. Now, some people, they might not um, be well suited to, to fasting, and that's not necessarily a problem. Uh, I'm not saying that someone needs to fast for um you know, for a week kind of thing. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is kind of very moderate calorie restriction um, or, 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 or time restricted feeding or, or intermittent fasting, for instance. And what this can mean is, is to fast for anywhere from 12 to 16 hours per day. Um, if someone can fast for 24 hours before doing the vaccine, for instance, then this might be helpful, but other people might not find that they can tolerate a fast that long and they might want to do 12 to 16 hours or, you know, 18 hours or something of that sort. Basically, when your body starts fasting, when you go into fasting mode, your, 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 your cells um, kind of detect that you are you, you have less energy coming in. And so what they do is they, um, they, they switch their resources away from building things up. They realize that you you've got less resources going on. They speed up the rate at which you're burning energy and they essentially, um, they, they, um, they divert resources away from generating proteins or away from building fatty acids and things like that away from that. And they, they shift that towards uh, a more, what's called a catabolic phenotype where you're breaking things down. And if our purpose is to break down MRNA before it's incorporated into proteins, then I think that we would want to be in this state. Okay. There are also several supplements which have been shown to activate this pathway. One is called berberine. Uh, curcumin can activate this. Um, NAC can activate this pathway. So many of the things already in this protocol can come in handy, first of all, in supporting the body to get into this state. But at the same time, um, using exercise to stimulate this pathway can also be uh, come, in ha come in handy. So um, this is doing a kind of moderate to high intensity endurance exercise. OK, I don't think that we would necessarily want to be lifting weights, um, lifting weights or doing any kind of intense resistance exercise. Um, what this can do is this can stimulate mTOR, which is kind of the pathway that we theoretically might want to stay away from whilst we're getting this vaccine. Um, and so doing something kind of lower intensity or doing something of the endurance type. Uh, again, this is going to stimulate the AMP cap. AMPK pathway, this is something which we might want to consider. Um, I would say immediately after the vaccine, what we also want to be focusing on, again, is stimulating how well the cells can clear out waste products, stimulating detoxification, and ideally helping the body to rid itself of whatever nasty stuff has been injected into us. And so, again, immediately after the vaccination, what I would probably look at doing is introducing a, uh, a high dose of liposomal glutathione to stimulate detoxification. Again, a dose of vitamin C is laid out by Gabby. I would want to be um, improving the sulfation pathway in the liver. So improving how our liver is conjugating stuff and carrying it out of the body. And so using Epsom salts, Epsom salts are a mixture of magnesium with sulfate and sulfate can really stimulate those pathways in the liver. And I would want to be doing four cups of salt in each bath. Um, and I would want to be staying in the bath for anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. If someone does have access to a sauna, that is also one of uh, the excellent ways to kind of stimulate how well we're clearing waste products. Not only are we going to be um, clearing stuff out through the skin, through the sweat, but also what a sauna is going to be doing is it's going to be mobilizing stuff and carrying it and kind of getting it into the bloodstream so that it can then go, go through the liver, either through the gut or through the kidneys. Um, and so the concept behind this is what we would want to do is we would want to be using some kind of binders as well. And a binder is, um, is a, a substance which contains or which has a certain affinity for toxic elements. And what this means is, is that various binders might include activated charcoal, 
bentonite clay. Um, there are some good products with different types of fibers, such as chitosan, such as um, some kind of soluble fiber. Psyllium husk can also do very well. And the concept is, is that as we are clearing stuff out through the liver into the gut, as through the bile duct, basically we're, we're conjugating up waste, binding it with, with our kind of glutathione and our other um, uh, nutrients which we use to clear out this stuff. We get it into the bile. It comes out through the gallbladder. When it gets into the gut, it can be reabsorbed later on. And we want to re- it interrupt that reabsorption. Um, the technical term is called enterohepatic recycling. What we want to do is interrupt that by providing ourselves with some kind of binder in the gut it binds with whatever toxin and that's going to prevent it it from being reabsorbed and it's going to be carried out into the toilet when we go to the toilet. So ideally what we're doing with this kind of protocol, again, it's theoretical, but it might come in handy is providing the body with lots of antioxidant and detoxification support, providing some, some degree of immunomodulation. We're using high doses of nutrients. We're using high doses of antioxidants at the same time, we're using a mitochondrial cocktail to stimulate energy metabolism, provide the cells with as much resources as they need to protect against some kind of threat or damage. And at the same time, we're trying to stimulate our body's um, repair mechanisms. We're trying to stimulate how the body is um, is clearing our waste products binding that in the gut and using different uh, modalities such as Epsom salts, such as sauna, if possible. Um, And at the same time, fasting to um, try to prevent the body's anabolic responses and get the body into a more catabolic state where we are less able, potentially less likely to be incorporating any exogenous mRNA into protein. Rather, the idea is theoretically at least to break that down. Um, yeah, that was the, the kind of concept behind it. That, um, that was there excellent. are a couple, couple extra recommendations in that article mm-hmm. by Gabby. Yeah. Um, Gabby, I know mentions uh, melatonin. Um, and she mentions a couple of pharmaceuticals as well. Hydroxychloroquine. Um, azithromycin, ambroxol, but people can probably go to the the article itself to read about those. Um, yeah, but that was that was excellent, Elliot. Um, oh, I think you're muted, Erica. If you were saying something, no, never mind. <laughs> I mean, oh, I, I wanted to say something. Hmm. Uh, Thanks for that protocol, Elliot. And I wanted to point out, like maybe if somebody just happened to come across the show for the first time, just to look at what this protocol might be. What Elliot just did here is indicative of someone who cares about your health. Like when this COVID thing just first came out last March, this is something that health authorities all over the world should have said, these are the protocols because this is so very dangerous. We care about your health. You should, everybody should be doing this. And you notice none of that happened. So yeah. take that as you will. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And again, it's, it's entirely this, this stuff, what we're dealing with, with this new mRNA vaccine, it's entirely experimental and we're playing with fire. Right. And, and no one really knows what we can do. We, we can just use, kind of we go follow the evidence we know what has been used in the past we look at the mechanisms and we kind of we theorize we would hope that this is what the health authorities would be doing mm-hmm. but they're not so at this point we kind of have to take you know take our own initiative or take take our health into our own hands and try to use the best tools that are known to us at least and there might be other things that might also come in handy but overall, I think that if you were to follow a protocol which was similar to this, or at least follow some of the recommendations in this protocol, I um, I can almost guarantee that you would ha- you you would have some more physiological protection against it. It's not to say that you're going to be p- c- completely protected against the vaccine because we don't know what it's going to do. But ultimately, if you're in a situation where you're forced to take this. And I would personally say, again, this isn't medical advice, but I would personally be saying that 
if I was in your situation, I would do everything in my power to avoid getting this vaccine. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And that means you may need to really consider, you know, if it comes to it, if you're in a health profession, if you're in a care profession, you may need to consider your job. You may need to reconsider that. You may need to consider your lifestyle or where you live. I don't know how serious it could get, but I know that I personally do not want to be a guinea pig. And I know no one else on this show wants to be a guinea pig either. And I'm sure most of our listeners don't. So I would hope that many people have taken the right kind of precautions. If, however, you are in a situation where you physically, you cannot avoid getting this vaccine by following these recommendations, you're at least going to be giving your immune system some support. You're going to be giving your cells some support. You're going to, going to be giving kind of your detoxification and your antioxidant systems some support. And if that's the best thing you can do, it's the best thing that you can do, you know? Um, it's a, yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> I think, I think that's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's better than crossing your fingers and wishing for the best. Definitely. Yeah. And I really hope that, you know, that our listeners don't, don't need to get the vaccine. I hope that they don't, but I also hope that if they do, that they're, you know, part of the section of people who don't get a reaction. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not guaranteed that any everyone is going to get a reaction. It's not guaranteed that, you know, this stuff is necessarily even going to have long-term consequences, but we want to put the right kind of precautions in place and, you know, do all that you can. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So, uh, anyone else have anything to add or is that all for today's show? I think, th I think that's good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I hope my rambling uh, made some sense it was great. <laughs> and I hope that people could kind of understand if they do want more information, then we will put the link to the article. It's up on shot. It's up on shot. So it can be found written by Dr. Gabby uh, as laid out on, on SOT. And if people want more details, they can go there. Uh, otherwise I want to thank my co-hosts, you guys. Um, and Damien, thanks on the wheels of still. Um, and to all our listeners, yep, yeah, you like and subscribe to our page and share it if you feel that it was helpful. Otherwise, uh, thanks for tuning in and we will see you next week. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.